to the 24th episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. In this episode, we're going to talk to John Briggs and Jack Weirden about Campfire Manager. We've also got another time-saving tip and we'll read your feedback. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Laura and joining me are Mark. Hello. Alan. Hello. And Tony. Hello. Hello. What have you been up to, Mark? Uh, I got some pet gerbils. Ah. Right. Are these electronic gerbils no. or real organic gerbils? Organic gerbils, yes. Homegrown, not homegrown. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm getting at. The little Fair fluffy trade. ones that, that run around in a tank and dig. A tank. In a tank. Army gerbils. Yeah. Are they underwater? Oh, not, a tank yes. underwater like a... gerbils. Do you know what I mean? A gerbilarium. Right, right. Okay. This I know is what far too technical for me already. Yes. So, Alan, I, I, I'm blown away by gerbilarium. Um, <laughs> I, I switched to gift gaff. Yay! Hey, welcome aboard. Now we can, now we can text you for free. Yeah. And phone. As and well. phone. Oh, yes, yeah, well, you know. No, not that, not that <laughs> any of you yeah. have ever phoned me ever. I don't think. Oh, I think, I've I, think I have. You. I think you might. I think you phoned me lots of times in Brussels. I f- oh yeah, that was fun. <laughs> I think I've phoned you when we've been on the way to somewhere and late. Yeah, that's Possibly true. Og Camp. Yeah. 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 yeah, so I phoned up my um, uh, Orange, who I was with, and said, hey, I've seen this gift gaff thing where I can get cheaper phones and uh, cheaper phone tariff and more data. Are Were they gonna... nice and neutral and balanced about gift gaff? No, they gave me some spiel about how gift gaff was terrible because they... They don't have um, proper customer service, and if it goes down, there's nothing you can do. And, and all they've that's got... exactly what I had Did when you... I switched to gift gaff. <laughs> all they've got is a website. I'm like, well, oh, it works all right for me. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Did you like... tell them about your job? <laughs> well, the, well, the thing is, the orange website doesn't even work anymore. They've got an <laughs> advert that pops up that causes the whole thing to grey, <laughs> and you can't actually use the website. So I cannot use the orange website at all at the moment. So I think I'm, uh, you know, a bit. Uh, I think it's gift gaff have an agent as well who've I've, who I've used right so i uh, and i i've been with orange since october 1995 i've had the same account same phone number all that time and they're you know that counts for nothing so <laughs> they cast you out yeah they're the like wind. yeah whatever so I'm like, okay cheerio then bye fair enough yeah mm. i wrote a blog post about my experience of leaving vodafone in the same way <laughs> <laughs> excellent oh yeah i might do that yeah, that'd be a good idea. That'd give me an excuse to embed my gift gaff referral code. <laughs> yeah, I did that too. <laughs> Tony, what have you been up to? Um, I've launched a new charity project that I'm working on. <laughs> charity. Uh, charity. I don't like to talk about it. But All right. Going, <laughs> but I'm going to because I want your money. Um, yeah, I'm going to uh, do a, I'm doing a fundraising thing for uh, Malawi, which a charity called the Amica Trust, which uh, supports better healthcare in Africa. Um, and... Uh, I'm doing a stupid thing, which is climbing the highest mountain in southern Africa. I don't wow. think that's the stupid part. Isn't it? <laughs> no. What's the stupid part? That's one of the very many stupid things that Tony does. Have I missed the small print somewhere? <laughs> is there something else involved? The stupid part is the things that bite you. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I have a... Malaria get, country. It is malaria country. I get quite badly bitten in this country. Yeah. Well, when, when is it? He has Amazon-level uh, insect repellent in this country. Yeah. Wow. In Lancaster. Yes. Um, so it's, I'm going next year to, okay. to climb up this mountain. So I've got about 10 months to raise the money that I need to raise in order to kind of qualify to go on the trip. Um, I'm doing that through Virgin Money and I'm going to put a link in the show notes so that people, if anybody wants to support me in doing this, you can. If you can chuck in a couple of quid, I'd be very, very grateful. Uh, if I don't reach my target, you know, eventually, uh, you're not going to hear the last of it. How are you going to motivate people to give you money other than you know, <laughs> guilt, guilt, tripping, <laughs> guilt tripping and then spamming them on Twitter? How are you going to do it? Well, I'm stupidly climbing this mountain, so if that isn't motivation enough, um, I will be doing I'm in. At, at the moment. <laughs> I've got some spare tickets to the BFI's screening uh, of the Doctor Who, the uh, Ninth Doctor stories, oh, yeah. uh, Bad Wolf and Parting of the Ways, um, and there's a, there's a prize draw going on. If you donate um, in the next week and a half or so, um, you can be eligible for going to prize draw for those tickets um so you can go along and see that screening and see some yeah. of the yeah. conditions apply so yeah That's I, in London. I, I i donated earlier today so if you, you want to make sure that i don't get those <laughs> tickets then you should also donate yeah if you want to disappoint alan yes. donate soon. very easy it's very cheap and easy to disappoint me yes <laughs> <laughs> by giving tony some money for charity yes so do that 
I'd be very grateful for any support anybody can give me. There'll be a link in the show notes. Laura, what have you been up to? Got good broadband. Ooh. Good broadband. I could do with some it's of that. It's more than good. It's 35 meg down. Wow. 8 meg up? 8 meg up. I think... We, I think we're going to have to put that to good use. Yes. We, well, it yeah. might get blocked, so just be careful about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. I can't access that anyway. We've uh, got yeah. fibre to the cabinet. Wow. Yeah, fibre to the BT Infinity. Mm. And it's fast. Wow. So we're going to do um, maybe hang out on a future episode? Yeah, we could try that. Yeah. yeah. See if people want to see our faces as well as listen to yeah. our voices. Yeah, There's, I can't think, think so. why. You'd yeah. have to shave there, Alan. No, my webcam's not that good. <laughs> right. It'd just be a blur. <laughs> yeah. Blue tech over it. It'd be awesome. fine. Excellent. Let's get on with the show. <laughs> On the line now are John Spriggs and Jack Weirden, who are going to talk to us about Campfire Manager. So, John, you're otherwise known as John the Nice Guy, and we know yep. from Og Camps in years gone by that you are a very nice guy. Tell us about Campfire Manager. Uh, so, um, Campfire Manager is the talk scheduling software that we've used at uh, Og Camp since the second one. It's gone through a few iterations. Um, sort of progressively getting the experience better as we've gone from year to year. And currently the one that we're focusing on is uh, Campfire Manager version 2, uh, which is actually Campfire Manager version 3, but that's all, <laughs> <laughs> it's all Laura's fault. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, it's, uh, it's software that um, was proposed for uh, <clears throat> bar camps and unconferences in general. Uh, but because of the fact that I'm an avid uh, Og Camp attendee, uh, I've only missed one, uh, and that was because you held it too far away from me when my son was very small. Um, <laughs> and uh, so yeah, so it's kind of it's it's evolved very much uh, to work well with the Og Camp uh, environment. That isn't to say it's not a good talk scheduling software for other events, but you know it's it's great for Og Camp. So um, ha- how do how do people actually use it uh, on the day? Um, so again, we've we've gone through a few iterations. Uh, it used to be that it was predominantly designed for sort of use with text messaging, and you know there'd be one or two static stations at the event. Um, as we've kind of gone through over the years, it's kind of become more and more obvious that whilst the SMS stuff is is an interesting niche. Um, realistically what people are now using is those smartphones with lots of internet connectivity that they've got in their pockets yeah um so predominantly around the event you'll have lots of screens uh or a few screens depending on the size of the event um with the big view of the the event uh and the intention is that as uh, as you as a participant are looking to see which talks to go to you, you look at this timetable which looks like a normal you know any any sort of grid it's it's like a, a normal bar camp grid and you say oh i'd like to go to talk number one um because that's in the right room and it's at the right time and it's the right subject that you're interested in so you get your phone out or you get your laptop out and you go to the page for the talk scheduling software if you want to, if you obviously you, you're not obliged to use this, but if you are interested in going to that talk, you open up your software, you, you bring up the website, and you say, "I'd like to go to talk number one." You click a button which says "Attend." When you click "Attend," it says you sure you want to attend this. You say yes, just because people click on things and have wacky mouses that don't do what they're supposed to do, and um, then you are marked as an attendee for that talk. Now, the reason why we're interested in tracking attendees is because um, we put the talks that have got them that are more popular into the larger rooms. It's kind of like the voting system that you do with post-it notes. Yeah. Um, so, th- I mean, ultimately, quite, that's quite a large part of where, where camp. One of the things that Campfire Manager came out from was that I went to a, a bar camp uh, and I gave a talk about something that was interesting to me and lots and lots of people came up to the talk so much so that the room was kind of four or five people deep outside of the room 
which for mm. me, I mean, it was only a tiny room, but that was because I didn't know that my subject would be of interest to more people than were there. Mm. So I thought, brilliant. Next, next bar camp I went to gave exactly the same talk and thought this was really popular at the last place I went to. Booked the main stage for it. <laughs> 300 people and I had six people in the audience. <gasps> and so... So I did my very best Eddie Izzard impression, complete with the rabbit ears and everything else, and it didn't sway them over. Although I did get people coming up wanting to talk to me about it afterwards. And I thought, you know what, that's really wrong, because it meant that someone else who had a talk that was genuinely going to attract more than six people couldn't have the main stage, and ultimately were probably in another area of the the event, uh, like there was where somebody had released a piece of software that, that weekend, and they thought they weren't going to get many people coming to their talk. And they booked a bar area, which is in a thoroughfare. And they were being stopped every sort of two minutes as somebody walked across. Well, tried, tried to push through hmm. the 25 right. deep crowd around the person to get past them. Okay, so in a nutshell, it dynamically allocates talks to rooms based on their popularity. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and... and one of the one of the problems we 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 know we've had in the past is not just putting the right talk in the right room the right capacity room but also mm-hmm. moving talks around because obviously throughout the day and throughout the the duration of a um uh, an event the number of people um who've put themselves down for a talk can go up and down yep. um so how how do you deal with like moving things around and letting every how does how does everyone know which uh, which talk uh, which room they're going to go to you know because things could move around couldn't they indeed so so we do a few things um, obviously we try and put as many boards up around the site as possible and because they're all linked to to the back end of this system um, you so know you can by, by boards John do you mean big TVs big TVs or, or projectors okay um, or, although the, the first non og camp event that I used campfire manager out we actually use jogglers so if you're running an unconference the traditional method like the, the simplest method you can get is a big sheet of paper with a load of post-it notes and people just kind of write their talk on a post-it note stick it on a grid and it generally happens there or then there may be a bit of voting or a bit of kind of shuffling around but it's kind the of system that i like to refer to as voting with your elbows yeah, yeah. um so yeah. what's wrong with that there's nothing wrong with it um in a, in a larger event, you can do better. Mm-hmm. You can be more smart. And um, so one of the bar camps that I have also been to a few of is the bar camp Blackpool. And they've got three rooms and you have to cross through the rooms to get from one room to the next. So if you're in a talking room A and you think, oh, a bit bored with this talk, and you, you go... I wonder what's in the other rooms. And you go into room two and talk that's in room two is a bit boring. You go into the room three and talk in room three is a bit boring. You've just disturbed not one talk, but three talks hmm. to find out actually what you want to do is go outside for a, for a breath of fresh air or a chat with someone. Right. And that's not to say that talks at Bar Camp Blackpool are boring because they're not. But, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm just, you know. I'm not, I'm not sure that you looking at your laptop to find out whether um the talks whether you would discover the level of boredom <laughs> in rooms two of rooms no, b but, and c but if you if you look at your phone and go actually they're talking about doctor who in room three and I'm okay about... so you could find out what they're talking about before going oh, okay yeah that makes yeah. more sense i, I thought you had some kind another, of premonition uh... Sorry, Another part of it, I guess, is that if you've only got one big post-it board, then all of a sudden 200 people need to stand next to this post-it board to yeah. see what's up. And well, it kind of solves the overcrowding problem as well. Okay, so so we've gone through the, the why and what it is. What's it written in? How does it all kind of plumb together at a high level? Okay, so it's um, HTT- HTTP is what you're interacting with. Um, it uses... What, I tell it to an Apache server and <laughs> talk right. HTTP. What? It. So, <laughs> it's sorry, a web it's page. A, it's, it's, a web, it's a web system. Thank you. Um, <laughs> sorry, Alan. Um, He's not very then... When I said high level, I mean one step above HTTP, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we use um, PHP and MySQL. Uh, it will then use some other systems to talk talk on sms if you enable that 
uh, you, it will talk to a system called Joined In, which is a little bit like you know, Lanyard, but mm-hmm. it's all open source and is written again by a member of the community that attends Og Camps. Is that yes. Lorna James um, project? Yes. To make it easier for people to kind of experiment and play around with it, we've actually set up uh, a Vagrant and Puppet set of scripts to bring up an instance of it if you want to sort of run it at home and test it out. Oh, nice. Stick to it. John, you started this thing. Jack, yep. why did you get involved? What is your mission with Campfire Manager? Uh, well, um, it all started rather strangely. Um, back when I was doing A-level coursework, I decided that I could either do some um, rather contrived system that I would never use again, or I could contribute to an open source project. Um, and that's kind of what I did. I, um, I'd, I'd seen uh, Campfire Manager mentioned before in some coverage of OggCamp that I'd uh, been watching and uh, heard some of it on, on this podcast of all places. Um, so I decided I'd see what I could do to contribute to the project. And from there, I've kind of followed on as a uh, as a front end developer and one of the things that i'm really trying to push for is, is getting spangly new toys on the front end so uh, at the, the <laughs> moment anyone who's unit who's used it will uh, have noticed we used um jquery mobile which is you know nice and big and friendly for touching with uh, with phones um which is what a lot of people have at uh, events like john said earlier um so yeah trying to get it to run on mobile devices and work properly and and not just have to load a whole massive page for example like a, a lot of the stuff we're trying to do now will have html5 application cache so you can store all the boring scripts and images and whatever once and the rest of it is just raw campfire manager data going backwards and forwards and not wasting your mo- precious mobile bandwidth that sounds awesome pages. that's especially useful at some of the um some of the uh, events that we've been at, including old camp where uh people are on wi-fi for example and you know, hundreds of people on a small set of wireless access points and you're all basically hitting the same server it kind of uh, makes sense to make that as lean as possible yeah definitely because i mean like there's one thing for mobile which was a lot of what i've been reading about to get this to work but then when you're talking like 400 people with a ridiculously small fraction of time to get onto the wireless before they get kicked off because someone else has jumped in <laughs> you've got to really kind of wrestle with code to make it work and are you having to um uh, you know we get a diverse set of people at these kind of events um you know iphones tablets laptops are you having to do a lot of work to uh make the site work across lots of different form factors and orientations and that kind of stuff um yeah so it's kind of mitigated in one sense by jquery mobile because that's designed to be um progressive uh, the progressive enhancement i think is what they describe it as so it'll definitely work even on the worst phones but only the shiny stuff comes up in the top ones and i was reasonably confident until last old camp when it turns out there was a bug in ios chrome but not in ios safari which is very strange um so I guess nothing beats raw testing across all devices, which yeah. is one of the reasons we've got the demos up. Um, so if people are listening and want to help um, see if it works on their phone, for example, I think it's a demo.campfiremanager.info or something like that. Um, and people can try it on their phones and see if it works or not. Oh, that's awesome. Part of what my longer term aim is for Campfire Manager is that it's not just a brilliant scheduling software for OggCamp, but it's a brilliant scheduling software for other events. Mm-hmm. Well, I have reached out to a few other events to see if they'll use it, but you know, at the moment it's very much focused on our camp. So, you know, things like text messaging is great for something in the same country, but if you're looking at maybe, and I'm picking a name out of the air here, we haven't got any sort of arrangement with these guys, but you know, if you were to look at something like FOSDEM or something mm-hmm. like that, where you have developers from lots and lots of countries all turning up in the same place they're going to be using Wi-Fi. They're not going to be using text messaging. Yeah. The only time when the text messaging might be useful is if you've got a conference that's aimed at a different group of people that aren't all geeks. Well, maybe there are some or, people out there who are planning a conference right now and thinking about maybe some more sophisticated scheduling software than a piece of paper with some post-it notes on it. And they should definitely give Campfire Manager a look because it, we have used it for our camp for you know four of our five years. Mm. Um yeah, okay, we've had some teething problems, but we've been proving it in the hot, well, white hot um, fire of, <laughs> oh, <laughs> of, an, of an event. I'll um, tell you something, it felt like a white hot fire last <laughs> yeah, year. Right. And, 
and uh, you know it has some extra functionality and things that you just don't get from the old manual methods so best of luck with it remind us one more time what the url is to find out more information john so campfire manager is available at campfiremanager.info which links to the github repositories it gives you a bit of an overview and we do have a demo system that is up and working right now at demo.campfiremanager.info so people should go and test it please do magic excellent well thank you very much indeed for talking to us this evening gents and uh, best of luck and we'll hopefully see you at og camp this year in october in october looking forward to it (laughs) excellent (laughs) cheers guys cheers guys Bye. bye 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 It's time for another command line love. Oh, yeah. And this time it's... <laughs> you weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> this time it's come from listener Jack Franklin on I'm not, Twitter. I'm not certain he's a listener, but he is on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I follow him on Twitter and he posted this and I thought, oh, that looks useful. Okay. Let's say he's a listener. He is. Hi, now. Jack. If Hi, you're Jack listening. Franklin. Yep. Um, anyway, the command is FC. That's for sure. cookie, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Football club. No? No. What does it do, Mark? So say you've, uh, you've written a command, and you want to run the same command, but you want to do something slightly different. So you want to do a find and replace, or you want to do, you know, a bit of editing on it, which is... And if you're like me, if you're used to Vim, then you can do some quite advanced editing quite quickly. But if you're just pressing up and then editing it on the command prompt, it's a bit of a hassle, because you've got to, like you know, scroll back through your command and type your bits and delete your bits and you can't do, you know, the kind of things you can do in Vim. So what happens if you type FC, it takes your last command, opens Vim or whatever you've got set to your default editor if you don't like Vim. So it could be Emacs or Nano or whatever, or get it. Um, and then it puts your last command into the editor and you edit it and then you save and you quit and then it runs the edited version. Oh, it runs it after you quit? Yes. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Mm. Is that so, not scary? Well, only as scary as typing the wrong thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I tried it and it showed, in my case, it used Nano as the editor. It brought it up. You could, you know, showed you the command. You can tweak it a bit. You hit exit and it goes away and runs that command. Huh. Um, so if you have got a very large, complex command, I can see there'd be a different advantage mm. in yeah. being able to I've do also, that. It could also be useful. I found sometimes when I'm SSH'd into a into some random box or sometimes when i'm um connected to my phone running ubuntu touch sometimes the terminal gets a little bit screwy and when you go back and forward it, yes. it doesn't wrap around properly yeah, and it overwrites gone, itself yeah if you've mm. gone further then it will just dis- like too many columns yeah and and if i try and edit and i end up as i'm typing it's overwriting the wrong bit of the command yeah. so if i could open that in a terminal the previous command i did that would be super useful. Mm. The good yeah. news is it seems to be part of the core Ubuntu install. It was just on my machine already. Yeah, so. I, think it's, I think it's a built-in. Cool. A bash built-in. I think so. Mm. I'm not certain of that. Excellent. Yes, it must be because I just did Witch FC and it returns nothing. Mm. So it must be built-in. Fantastic. Well, that's a very good command line love. Yeah. <laughs> It's now time for your feedback. Uh, We asked on our Facebook page, are you getting an Ubuntu Edge? If so, why? If not, why not? And you said... Uh -uh. (laughs) (laughs) Uh-uh. Ding! (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Uh, Mike Mombarg said, uh, not going to get it too expensive for me right now. It's fair enough. Peter Adams said, I'm not paying that price for one, but I've just put in a request for one in a letter to Santa and threw it in the fire. (laughs) <laughs> Good okay, is that, is that where I've been going wrong? Yeah. Uh, Sean Tilly say Sean Tilly, that's cool. <laughs> we have interviewed Sean on the show. Yeah, I, I want one, but there's no way I can afford it. Hmm. Oh, there's a pattern here. Mm. Ian Farrell, who we interviewed, uh, said, "I'm signed up. Did it almost straight away. I'm excited and really hope it hits the target." Me. Mm. Bruno Girin, Girin, yep. said, "Because I want one, and I need a new phone anyway." 
That's a reasonable excuse. It yeah. is. Shane Fergan says, Good nope, luck. can't really afford it right now, but we'll probably get whatever random Ubuntu phone is out at the launch instead, so I don't think I'm going to miss much. It's a cool phone, though, and I would probably have bought it if I had the money. Mm-hmm. And Simeon, Simon Cool? Simeon. Simeon Cool said, yes, because it's an awesome device, and I simply want it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Interesting. Mm. Interesting range, uh, mix of things. Hmm. Lots of people saying it's very expensive, which yes. it is. It's funny that Ian saying he um, signed up almost straight away. When um, when we knew it was going to launch, myself and Jono were out in um, in Portland in the hotel and we were um, getting our laptops online knowing that it was going to go live at 1600 UTC um, and we wanted to get our cards out and get ourselves signed into Indiegogo so that we one of one or either of us would be the first one to right, to <laughs> bag the 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 phone um but we both ended up having kind of weird credit card and paypal type problems so we never ended up being uh one of the first Aww. and while i was on the stand at oscon um a lady called kate came up to me and said hello and introduced herself she works for indiegogo and she said oh by the way i was the first one to back <gasps> it <laughs> are they gonna like, be are they gonna have the numbers etched on the back uh only for the uh people who've paid ten thousand for the first 50 Ah, right. I don't know if the rest will have serial numbers. I did notice actually in the rendering, in between the volume up and the volume down button, there's a binary number. Oh, Ooh. yeah, it's binary fifty. I thought it might be forty-two, but I've, that would be cool. Someone's clearly not playing ball. <laughs> <laughs> Kuhn from the Netherlands emailed. I read about Ubuntu, uh, Canonical's Ubuntu Edge crowdfunding, and I instantly thought of another crowdfunded smartphone, the Fairphone. The people of Fairphone are producing 20,000 phones that last longer, ruining the environment less heavily, and are built by employees working under better conditions. I pre-ordered a Fairphone, and I'm interested in how Ubuntu Edge and Touch develop. Actually, I was wondering how good a, good of a deal the Edge is compared to the Fairphone. Sure, it has better specs, but is it worth almost double the price? Yes. <laughs> I'm happy with my Fairphone, and I hope one day it will be even fairer, not only green and social, but also transparent, which presumably makes it harder to see. The, F- the Fairphone team have talked with Canonical about using Ubuntu Touch on the Fairphone, but currently they're using Android. Interesting. That'd be cool. The Fairphone's quite... They've, um, so, yeah, they've basically gone out and tried to source all these components ethically and sustainably. They've got this big map of, like, the whole chain of where wow. they get stuff from and what the status is of each in terms of how well they've done in getting it how they want it. So you've got, like, green bits and red bits, depending on how much right. they know about where it comes from and the working conditions and the sustainability. It's really impressive. It's funny. It's um, There's a certain set of criteria, you know, you could, uh, of, you know, how far you go in terms of openness, transparent, transparency, and so on. And... You know, we're we're talking. One of the things we're talking about um, Ubuntu Edge is the fact that it's a very open device. You can you can flash it. We're not going to lock it to a particular carrier. Um, you know, you, if you wanted to wipe Android off it and and put something else on there, or if you wanted to wipe Ubuntu Touch off and put Cyanogen Mod on there, or whatever you want to do, we're trying to make it as open as possible um, to to modify because it's you know it's your device. And some people applaud that. Other people say that's not far enough and you need to have the open source bits inside your device mm-hmm. and that the, the fact that you're using um, you know, a, a, a DSP or a GPU or a radio that has a binary blob in it makes it an unacceptable device. Whereas other people come from the ethical sourcing point of view like Fairphone and say, well, it's unacceptable that you're using these materials like magnesium or, or, or you know, uh, sapphire or whatever in, in the device. And I learned that you cannot possibly keep everyone happy. Mm. Well, you can't. And that's why the Fairphone's got this, uh, presumably it's some kind of matrix of yeah. where things come. And so it's not going to be perfectly green or whatever. Mm. It, as you said, it does have yeah. red bits, but you just have to set your criteria. Yeah. Ed emailed eagerly, explaining, exclaiming, sorry, uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I love the show. Great job. On the Ubuntu website, it doesn't seem to state the minimum hardware requirements for each Ubuntu desktop release. A lot of the Ubuntu derivatives, such as Zubuntu, clearly state the minimum hardware requirements. Can you shed any light on where I might find out this information for Ubuntu desktop releases? I know there are various third-party websites that tout this information, but I would prefer to know the official stance on hardware requirements before I go doing a fresh install with a new release comes out, only to find that I have to wipe the hard drive again later and install a lighter distro because Ubuntu is too sluggish. 
Uh, we certainly used to have that information yes. on the website. I don't know if in during the design redesign it's been lost somewhere. Um, but uh, the easy thing to do is to file a bug against um, Ubuntu website content. Oh, um, Launchpad. Launchpad.net slash Ubuntu dash website dash content. Um, and I will do that right now. Brilliant. Well, while Alan's doing that, Mark is going to read an email from Adam Lowe, who still listens despite not using Ubuntu anymore. He now uses Arch, and he emailed to suggest... Why not give the time in Unix spoken as a binary value? Ah, so this is the end of the show when we say what time the next live episode is going yes. to be. And we get a bit confused because we try to give it in UTC and then British time. For and then people. we get complaints from people saying it should be GMT and not UTC. Yes. It'll yes. be better come October because at least there's one less. Yeah. Is there? Yeah, because we don't have to worry about BST oh, versus GMT true. and UTC anymore. Yes, yeah, all become Unix one. time spoken as a binary value. Okay. That sounds easy. <laughs> okay. Alan's working it out now. No, I'm not. <laughs> no, no, actually, he's reading the next email. Uh, Hopefully. No, why? maybe he's not. Yep. And finally, <laughs> the excellent, intelligent, beautiful people at linuxlinks.com have reviewed a bunch of Linux podcasts and decided which one was best. Oh, really? Um, was it the uh, was it that one in America? Well, the one that what no. they said was, no? oh. the interlude music is catchy, the podcast is exceptionally easy to listen to, extremely engaging, and the hosts are great fun. Does great, that sound like a podcast? A great podcast fun. Really? Great they fun. They sound like amazing people. I'd yeah. really love to spend two hours every fortnight with them. <laughs> two hours. <laughs> wow. wow. Excellent. Um, yes. That was really nice. They, yeah, they wrote a lovely review of lots of different podcasts, and yep. they gave us 10 out of 10. Yeah, we were the best one that they said. Out of 20 <laughs> podcasts. Rub it in. Yeah, we're the best of the 20 they reviewed. So thank you very much indeed, Linux Links people. That was very nice. Yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah. include a link to that. Warmed yeah. our hearts. Promi- hosts, prominently on the website forever. The yeah. hosts are do great a, fun. Do we need a badge? We should get a badge. <laughs> from one. them or for them? We'll just make one up. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. We'll Number say it's from podcast. them. <laughs> we'll send them a t-shirt or something. Okay. Do we have we'll put a link to the website. Not. No, we haven't got a t-shirt. We're not going to send you one. Okay. <laughs> That's the end of your standard disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> That's the end of your feedback. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that enthralls, exasperates, or elevates you, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. Please do get in touch. I mean it. Just one message. Just to know there's someone out there who cares. And that's it for this episode. Join us on Wednesday the 14th of August at 19.30 UTC. That's 8.30 here. <laughs> Where here is in your earphones. Yeah. And that's our next live episode. Uh, yeah, so half past eight in the evening for those in the UK, work it out if you're elsewhere. And one three seven six five zero eight six zero zero for those counting in Unix time. <laughs> you actually did it. Oh my god. That's not binary though. No, we'll have to do that next oh. time. I just yeah. did that off the top of my head. Tune in next <laughs> next time to watch us on a webcam, read it out in binary. <laughs> well wow. that's worth ten out of ten, isn't it? I don't need these <laughs> Oh dear. Yeah, thanks, thanks for listening. For, yeah, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll Cheers, see you next guys. time. Bye. 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 Bye.